Okay. So uh, I'm here with Mindy Portnoy, Rabbi Mindy Portnoy of Temple Sinai in Washington, D.C. The date is November 9th, 2010. Mindy has agreed to uh, talk about her, her life and her career. So thank you, Mindy. You're welcome. Um, let's start with your decision to become a rabbi. What, was there an aha moment? Well, the timing was very fortuitous. Um, I was uh, a junior in college when Sally Presant was ordained a rabbi in 1972. So I was beginning to think about what was I going to do the rest of my life. And I was spending my junior year at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and my parents um, <clears throat> sent me the, one of the famous, artic the famous article, as we call it, in the Women's Rabbinate, uh, about Sally Presant, which, was, which the title of which um, was, Her Ambition is to be a Rabbi and a Housewife. Um, this was in 1972, um, and I it was a picture of Sally in a mini skirt at the HUC Library, and she was the first the first woman rabbi, and uh, I think that's when it became, in my mind, an option because had I not done that, I was majoring in religious study, I was spending my junior year in Israel, I knew Hebrew, so probably my direction would have gone in maybe perhaps getting a PhD in Judaic studies or going into Jewish social work or you know, even law school, you know, the fallback position for everyone. Um, and suddenly this became another, you know, another real option. Here was a woman who was going to rabbinical school. Did, did you consider it a, a calling or a career? Or is there a You spectrum? know, at the time, I never considered it a calling. I, at the time, I think I really wanted to study what I would study in rabbinical school. In the end, I actually spent a year in graduate school in Jewish studies before and working for a year before I went on to rabbinical school. I think partly because I was a woman and because I thought that one should really be sure about wanting to go to rabbinical school. I didn't want to go and then, you know, discover I didn't like it and drop out because I thought it would reflect badly on, on women. So I ended up taking a, doing a couple of other things before going to rabbinical school. And were, were your, uh, was your family encouraging? Very encouraging. Now, I come from a conservative Jewish background. Mm -hmm. I do not come from a Reformed Jewish background. So, um, but of course, Jewish Theological Seminary at that point was not ordaining women. And, you know, I thought it would be another lifetime before they would do so. I mean, I was wrong, but it was too long for me. I had been influenced by a number of Reform rabbis and had worked in a Reform uh, Hebrew school. So going to, you know, a... Um, HUC, Hebrew Union College, which is where I was, where I studied, you know, was not such a big leap for me. And my parents were, they thought it was a, you know, great idea. They, they, they loved arguing with people about it. If people didn't like the idea, they would love having arguments about it. With Did them. you have brothers? No, one sister. One I'm an sister. older sister. Okay. So were, was in your family, it was no distinction between what the boys can do and what the girls can do? No, no, no. There were, I mean, we just... You know, it was the right moment in history, I guess. And I had, I, I'd been, I was in the first class of women at Yale. So I had kind of, I, I always joke about how I go to schools that only accept men, and then, then I enter them. So I mean, it's, uh, it was kind of, I'd had the experience of being in a place that was all men, and then going to rabbinical school, which was not all men, but you know, had been all men, and uh, it just kind of continued in that way. Now, the decision to apply to Yale as a, a first. What gave you the self-confidence to do that? Well, I grew up in New Haven, so I was a townie. I was a mm -hmm. local. And when Yale decided to accept women in 1969, that was a big deal in New Haven. I mean, everyone talked about it. I had already applied to all the schools I was going to apply to, so it was really a matter of just sending in another application, and it seemed like a it's kind of a lark at the time. And then I was accepted, and my sister had gone to Smith, and my theory was that since she spent most of her weekends coming on buses to New Haven, to meet guys at, at mixers, I might as well just stay, you know, go to school during the week at Yale and be there on weekends as well. So it really was not so not so complicated a decision. So in, in both your undergrad and then in, in the, your um, rabbinical school, did, did you have a sense of being a first or that this was different? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, now it's just funny when women rabbis, younger ones, come up and say, oh, you were one of the pioneers uh -huh. and I like, Really, I really didn't think of that so much at you the didn't time. Think that. Um, I think so. I think it was more at Yale because the, the the world made a bigger deal out of it. There was a lot of press about it, and it was a very big deal because it was literally the first class, the first freshman class of women. Rabbinical school, well, 
even though in retrospect I realized there weren't many of us, my class had maybe seven women in the class, which already seemed, and there had been a few women ordained already, maybe five by the time I was ordained, so didn't quite have the same um, feeling. And, and I guess because I'd already been at Yale, it was there were always a lot of guys around, so it didn't feel as, as special. But there were a lot of people at that point who were still not at all happy that there were women you know, in rabbinical school. And, and how did that manifest itself? Well, um, in, in my experience, I was a student rabbi for one year in Ellenville, New York, the Catskills, near the old Nevely Country Club. And the year before, they also had a woman student. And, and the, many people in the congregation did not want a second year of a woman student. They said, well, you know, we don't, we're not, we, you know, we did it. We did our time. And, of course, the school's policy was you get whoever, whichever student we send you, you get or you don't get anybody. Um, and, you know, I went to the congregation and I'm a new student. I'm young. I'm not experienced. And the first Friday night, you know, this... I still remember this man came up to me and said, I just want you to know I don't think women should be rabbis. <laughs> you know, it was not very encouraging. How, do you, um, how did you respond to um, that? I said, well, I hope, you know, we'll learn to get along. And I was, you know, I had a good sense of humor in those days. And I ended up officiating at his son's bar mitzvah by the end of the year. And I think we did pretty well. But, um, you know, there clearly was, you know, you were dealing not just with the reform movement, which was getting used to it, but then the larger Jewish world that, was was getting used to the idea, and all our professors, of course, at rabbinical school at that time were were male. I mean, we I think only our homiletics, our speech teacher, was a female. Did, did you have uh, role models or someone who mentored you? Um, not really. In terms of, um, I mean, there were no other women rabbis really, except for young ones out there. And uh, no, I th I think we kind of mentored each other. I mean, one of the things we did was create our women's rabbinic network early on in uh, about, I guess, 70, I started rabbinical school in 75, and uh, around 76 we started, as we joked about it, we used to meet in, you know, the men, the ladies' rooms at conventions, and then we started meeting in hotel rooms because we got to more of us, and now we have, every other year we have a big convention in all parts of the world, so it's really changed, but I think we really, we would meet with each other and talk about things from, you know, really practical things like salaries and and maternity leave and then things that might be less important but you know like what do you what do you wear for a bar mitzvah service where you're invited to the party afterwards you know those kinds of things that who do you ask that kind of question mm -hmm. I mean I think our mentors were more people you know women who were in other professions who had who had done these things but the idea of what it mean to be a woman and a rabbi was really and then and then of course after a while then being a woman and a rabbi and a mother and you know there were all kinds of stages to it. So if you had to look at someone uh, who might have been a role model for you subconsciously or consciously, who, who would that have been? Oh, I guess, I mean, this is like the cliched answer, but I think it was my mother because she had gone back to work um, as a teacher and got her master's degree in sort of mid-career and, uh, you know, was very, um, very involved in uh, teachers' union activities. So she was uh, certainly someone who was out there and well-educated and, and, you know, had stayed at home for a long time in her, in her generation until her kids were, like, you know, going to school, but then had gone back to work and was, um, you know, really very supportive of, of my doing this. There was never any question about you know, should I do this? Would this be a good thing? Or I mean, it was just my parents were very supportive of that. So that, that really helped because there were a lot of, I mean, there were women rabbis out there whose parents were not supportive mm -hmm. and who really thought it was a bad, you know, bad idea mm -hmm. or, you know, you'll never get a husband who's going to marry you. Of course, the, the advantage I had was that I was already married before I started rabbinical school. Mm -hmm. So my parents didn't have that argument. And obviously your husband was Support. Not a rabbi. Uh -huh. <laughs> people always, that's one of the uh -huh. most common questions people ask women uh -huh. rabbis is, they used to, maybe not Why so much do you think anymore. They, ask that? they say, because I can't the think they can marry anyone else would want. I, my theory is trying to not be too negative here. I think it's because I can't imagine anyone else would marry a woman rabbi. So they always say, was your husband a rabbi too? And I always say, no, he's, you know, a lawyer. And, um, and, but I get that question for years. I would get that. Uh -huh. Question. There were two. There are two, three questions which I used to want to hand out a card, which would say the first question was, well, how many women rabbis are there? Who was the first woman rabbi? And what do they call your husband? Those are the three questions that were asked. I really could have hand, literally handed out business cards with the answers to those questions. Uh, do you, Do you 
see, so you don't see yourself as such a, a pioneer role model for others, even though others see you that way. Well, I, I do more a little bit now because people respond to me that way. Um, I guess especially because I wrote my, I, in addition to being a congregational rabbi, I, I write children's books. And my first children's book was Ema on the Bema, My Mommy is a Rabbi. And I guess the first time a younger woman rabbi said to me, oh, you know, my mom read that to me or my dad read that to me when I was a little girl. I think, oh my God, I'm that old. But it was, you know, it was the sense that that it was possible to be a, a woman rabbi, and that for those of us who were out there, we were really serving as role models for, you know, little girls growing up that they could be rabbis too. I don't think I thought about it quite as much while I was going through the experience. Mm -hmm. Now I see it more. Do you, would you consider yourself a um, uh, part of the? part of the women's movement, a Jewish feminist? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there is no way, there is no way any of us would be doing what we do without the women's movement and without the influence of women going into different professions and uh, the, the just opening the possibility, the fact that the Hebrew New College, which had thought about this idea since 1922, finally actually accepted a woman who would you know, enter the school and finish and be ordained and really backed it up. I mean, there's no question that came out of the feminist movement. It wasn't necessarily an internal Jewish process. It fit in with everything else going on in the world at the same, the same time. Now, as, as one of the first female rabbis in Washington, D.C., do, do you consider Washington, D.C. to be a, a good place for a, a female rabbi? Was it at the time? Um, yeah, because I think there's so many women professionals here, and so um, um, I'm just, I need to take a sip of water here, which I don't have much of, so <coughs> I think um, Washington was a really good place to be because there are so many women, other women professionals, and therefore, you know, it's not really strange to be you know, a lawyer here, or a doctor, or, mm -hmm. you know, policy person, um, you know, it just fit in with a lot of what other women were doing at the time. Um, and uh, so I think, also, I was a Hillel director first with students, and students, of course, kind of accept things as they are, and they were going through changes in the world, and so I was a few years older than my students, and it was, you know, they just thought it was very interesting, you know, that they was a woman rabbi. Um, I, I always thought that the one other thing that people would say to me when I used to do services at the beginning at American University where I was the Hillel director for five years, um, you know, people would come to a service, especially faculty members, they come up at, to you afterwards and say, well, this is the first service I've ever been to with a woman rabbi. And, you know, you always wanted to think, well, what did you think would happen? Like the roof would cave in or, you know, or they'd say, oh, it's really nice. And this is, I've never been to one of these before. And over the years, of course, those questions mm -hmm. changed to, um, oh, I have a cousin's cousin who goes to a congregation, so and so, and they have a woman rabbi. And now, I almost never get a comment about it. Well, that must be extremely gratifying. Yeah, I mean, thirty years later, it's 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 nothing. I mean, it doesn't. There's there's just no one notices. I also used to be able to say, thirty years ago, that I knew every female rabbi in the world, mm -hmm. and I mean, I could, and I literally did. I probably knew everything about them too. And now. Of course, I go to conferences, and I don't know three quarters of the people there. Mm -hmm. Women rabbis conferences, so that's that's great. Yeah. Now, be, uh, mm -hmm. moving to a, a congregational position from Hillel, you know, the, you would hear I, in the in the atmosphere where all these uh, worries about well, women aren't tough enough, men don't want to unburden themselves to a female, just general resistance. Did those thoughts occur to you? Were you worried about any of that? I don't think so. First of all, I've been doing, you know, I'd been working for five years before I came to a congregation. I was a little older. I was, you know, kind of settled in my personal life. I was, I was married. I had two children. So I was, you know, I kind of felt like a grown-up coming into a congregation. Um, also, I always worked here with a colleague who was male. So there was never, I was never in a congregation where I was the only rabbi in the congregation. I personally think that was to, you know, it just happened that way here at Temple Sinai, but I think it was to everyone's benefit um, because uh, people had different kind of role models and people could make a choice as to, um, you know, which rabbi they wanted to confide in or which rabbi, you know, they liked better or, you know, whatever. Um, of course, kind of ironic because the rabbi I worked with until recently who just retired was um, 
was not into the some traditionally male things like sports, which I'm very into. So, you know, I always joked about how I was really the male rabbi here because I would talk to the guys about sports and mm -hmm. baseball and basketball and all of that. So, um, uh, but I, I think it was to the advantage of the congregation. Now, this congregation at Temple Sinai is an extremely politically correct congregation, and most people are politically liberal Democrats. Not everybody, but many. Um, and so I think people were, and they'd had a couple of women student interns over the years. So having me as the rabbi wasn't exactly shocking, you know. So, you, you know, talking to you, it sounds like you were never nervous, never had self-doubts or uh, worried about acceptance? Well, no, I, I mean, I'm nervous like anybody is. I always tell my bar mitzvah kids, I say, you know, when I get up on the high holidays in front of, you know, 1,500 people in the sanctuary, you know, I'm, I still get a little nervous. You know, I'm thinking, oh, is my sermon okay? What are people going to think? And I said, and so, you know, it's okay for you to be nervous before your bar bat mitzvah, believe me, that's okay. And I give them advice about looking at someone who will give them confidence and all of that. Um, but I don't think I was, I don't think much of it ever had to do with being a woman. It had to do with just being a rabbi, which is really a rather bizarre job in many ways. And, you know, feeling like, um, you know, as my daughter usually was, used to say to me, she'd say, I'd, I'd say something that people had come to talk to me about during the day, obviously without using names, and she'd say, Mom, I can't believe that people come to talk to you about that. Like, why do they come talk to you? Um, but, you know, that's, kids keep you grounded. Um, but I, I think that, I don't think it was ever so much that being a woman was the issue. It was more, you know, was I able to do, to do the job? And I think it's partly, you know, I think I was born, like, it's sort of at the right moment in in history in terms of women's roles, you know, because I, I took advantage of it. Yeah, and my sister's six years older and we are a little bit mm -hmm. different. I mean, in terms of she's pro a professional and everything, but I think just in terms of um, how women saw themselves in the world, that, that timing was very, very special, very special. Mm -hmm. So you feel lucky? Yes, I do. I do. I feel um, very lucky that I had the opportunity. Sometimes I feel especially moved by actually more, sometimes more by women cantors than women rabbis because you know in Jewish tradition the idea of listening to a kol isha the women's voice is considered you know that traditional men will not listen to a woman sing and I I think of the generations of women who s sang beautifully and were not able to be cantors and we have a woman cantor here and you know that to me is is always there's it feels like there was this great loss over the centuries of women who could have contributed that to their community and you know I, but I feel that about you know, I always feel very privileged to live, have lived at this moment where I could do what I what I wanted to do. And with my background, I mean, I had the right background at the right at the right moment. Now, when when you say that being a rabbi is a bizarre position in some ways, want to explain that? Well, it, it's my because it well it's very eclectic there's a there's a lot of different kinds of things we do um which can be explained in you know clear language you know you say oh i teach and i preach and i lead services and i officiated life cycle ceremonies and all the kinds of things you can kind of list as what you do in counseling but again there's sort of the role of the rabbi which means different things to different people often based on how they were brought up um, it's the kind of thing, for example, if you get on an airplane and you sit next to someone and they say, so what do you do? And my husband might say, oh, I'm a lawyer. And then my, maybe they'll ask one more question. They'll say, oh, you work for the government or a private firm? And they'll say, I work for the government. And then, unless they're really interested, the conversation ends. There's no way to tell someone you're a rabbi and have it just die you know, the, on the conversation. They'll say, if they're Jewish, they'll start telling you all about their religious school background, how they hated Hebrew school when they were growing up, and um, and if they're if they're Catholic, they'll tell you about their priests, and they'll tell you about, but it suddenly becomes, uh, and they'll ask you all kinds of questions about, oh, you're a rabbi, and how long have you been a rabbi, and it's, it's just unusual enough that most people don't know rabbis, you know, or they don't have regular conversations with rabbis, and they come in with all the stereotypes of what they think. I mean, I still, after 25 years here, have people, you know, will tell some off-color joke and they'll say, oh, sorry, Rabbi, you know, as if I've never heard an off-color joke. Or, or And they know me well as a person. Mm -hmm. So there's just this, and the peop, kinds of things people are willing to come and talk to me about um, 
you know, some people would say it's like, a, you know, a free psychiatrist, mm -hmm. but it really is people are willing to come and talk on just incredible range of issues and because of the rabbinic title and what that means to them. And often it has more to do with them than who I might be or, or my colleague. And that's been, um, that's been very interesting to, um, to sort of contemplate over the years. And sometimes it feels very good because I can be very helpful to people. And sometimes, you know, every once in a while it feels a little fraudulent, you know, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really not God. You really, that's not what I'm doing. Um, and it's, but overall it's been, it's been, it's been good. It's been a very positive, I mean, you know, I wouldn't redo it. I wouldn't do something else instead. Do you ever have the, have the feeling that you don't want to tell someone what you do because you don't want to get Oh, I have, I have done that. Oh, I've done that. Especially with um, hairdressers over the years, um, with other people who you're going to see again and then have to continue the conversation. Absolutely. There have been times, I'm admitting it in front of the camera, that I've said I'm a teacher, which is not untrue <laughs> or something, because it just, you don't want to engage in the, in the conversation. I also think it takes young rabbis, and maybe especially women back then, because we again felt perhaps there was a certain feeling of inauthenticity or we weren't, you know, did people really think of us as rabbis? You know, I, you know, like standing in a, in a public place and suddenly you hear someone say, rabbi. I remember early on it was just, well, they couldn't be talking to me. And then after the years went by, then I assume they're talking to me. But it it still took a while to feel, oh, am I, I'm really a rabbi? You know, I'm, that's, yeah, I guess I am. So uh, some of that was interesting to mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think that women approach the rabbinate differently than men? Well, you know, that's a tricky question. Um, I'm sort of like, a, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an old school feminist in the sense of I think that um, my goal is really that women and men should be able to do the same things in whatever ways their own personalities or unique identities affect what they do, but that there's not sort of a woman's way to do things. And I know there's... Uh, a sense, and it may not be totally wrong, that women uh, in some ways made the rabbinate more accessible and less distancing and, you know, somehow the people felt more comfortable talking to women at, when as a rabbi and it wasn't like the old model of the the rabbi with the deep and bell voice and standing on the bima and literally looking like a stereotype of God. Um, but I think and perhaps there's some truth in that, but I think that's also generational. I think, you know, my generation, we grew up in the 60s, and we're, we're different in many ways um, from previous generations. So I'm not sure all of that is, is male or female or gender. I think it's other factors. Um, but, of course, we expanded the range of experiences people have. I mean, before there were women rabbis, there were no rabbis who were mothers, Okay, there were fathers, but there were no mothers. And so clearly, certain experience we've had, we are able to share with congregants and understand certain things that perhaps um, our, co our male colleagues would experience only vicariously. And therefore, I think that's just it helped the rabbinate in general. But I know female rabbis who were very you know, distant and sort of tough and others who are much more gentle and, and I, I just hate to put everybody in the same mm -hmm. in the same box. But I, I am willing to say that it's um it's certainly opened up the role models for, you know, little girls and little boys to see the rabbinate differently. That must have been one of the most rewarding parts of, of your career. Oh yeah. And that and and that kids don't even know it's an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like for them you know, I remember the early years here going to speak, you know, every congregation and group in town invited me to speak about being a woman rabbi. You know, that was like a topic. Nobody asked me to do that anymore. Um, but, you know, I remember going to visit a class one day in a conservative synagogue, and the kids, you know, they, the, the, the teacher introduced me. Uh, we have, you know, here's Rabbi Portner today to talk about Hanukkah, I think, or something. And and that's what she said, and the kids smiled, and here's Rabbi Portner. And then she said, um, she's a woman rabbi. Now, the kids in that room didn't, did not, they, they were introduced to a rabbi. They accepted that, as children do. It was adults in the early days who would be so amazed that it was a woman rabbi. Like, wow, this is, and it could be even positive, but they noticed it in ways that kids just, well, that's, you know, that's who she is. And um, I was, you know, thought that was kind of interesting that, that kids would just, you'd say, hi, I'm Rabbi Portnoy. They'd say, hi, Rabbi Portnoy, you know, and it wasn't, you know, certainly for my children, that was just, that's what I did, mm -hmm. you know. 
did either of your children uh, express an interest in following in your no. footsteps? No, no. One of them, my son, uh, moved to Israel a year ago. He made Aliyah a year ago, and he's uh, a good secular um, Israeli, um, which is what he's, his goal in life is to be. I think he lives in Israel, so as he told someone, so he's he's been to enough services for a lifetime. So um, he's he's not like, he's happy in Israel, but not looking to be religious. My daughter uh, is in law school, and she's not planning to to be a rabbi. I, I, it's, that's an interesting question, and someone needs to study this. The Jewish Women's Archives needs to study this, whether there are percentage-wise the children, because a lot of rabbis' sons, or rabbis' children, male rabbis' mm -hmm. children, become rabbis. I'm interested in seeing over time mm -hmm. whether what the percentages of women and their children, whether more or less, and I keep thinking that it will be fewer that women, because women come home and share more about Again, this might be a stereotype. I don't know. And they see more of the reality um, of what the r rabbi's life is like, and then they say, "Oh my God, I would never want to do that." So I'm just made that up. So I'm, I'd be interested in someone studying that someday. Boys want to be like their dads, and and girls want, don't want to be like their mom. No. Well, I don't know. I think it's just that you know. I think. You know, I know I always came home and it was very, you know, real. It's not like I shared confidences with mm -hmm. my family, but they knew when there was stress and they knew, you know, when the phone rings and it's, you know, a funeral and someone died. It was a very, you know, common thing. The phone rings and it's so-and-so and my his mother died or whatever. And just the, the stress and the, you know, all those kinds of things. I don't know. I mean, I do know children of women rabbis who are becoming rabbis, but I'm, it's an interesting thing to see what the next generation yeah. does. Mm -hmm. My children are definitely, neither one of them is um, interested in this. Although my colleague, Rabbi Reiner, his son became a rabbi. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. Now, your, your son in Israel. Yeah, I, he's I, in Israel. I assume you, you, you yourself feel connected to Israel? Mm -hmm. Yes, very. I just got back, actually, from a, from a trip to see him. I hadn't seen him in 10 months. So Do you remember your first... Uh, visit to Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was a junior in college. I spent mm -hmm. my junior year at Hebrew University, and I had never been to Israel, and I had no relatives there, and I just went off to do my junior year in college. And did it have a uh, some kind of transformational oh, yeah. effect it was on you? Yeah, the highlight of my life that year in Israel was. Um, I then spent my first year in rabbinical school in Israel as well. But that was the year when, fortunately, I had an Israeli roommate, an Israeli boyfriend. I spent a lot of time with Israelis, not necessarily with Americans, which was really good for my Hebrew and for my experience of Israel. So, um, and I've you know been back many times since. Mm -hmm. And the first year of rabbinical school, uh, Reform rabbinical schools are required to spend the year in Jerusalem. So we were there. I was married by then, but we were, you know, spent another year um, in Israel. So you know, and of course, I've traveled a lot there uh, since. And yes, I feel a very strong connection to to Israel. Did you grow up in a Zionist home? I, I don't think we called it that, but yes, it was, you know, it was very, I mean, we were connected Jewishly in conservative movement, and Israel was very much a part of it. My parents never got to Israel until I was in Israel, mm -hmm. um, mostly for economic reasons, mm -hmm. but they finally went there when I was in Israel and came to, to visit me. So it's actually also the first time my mother was ever on a plane. So, um, but it was, um, but it was great. They had a wonderful, you know, I'm glad they did that. Um, um, now, I know you, you've written th three or four books. Five. Five. five <laughs> books. The, the three I know are Ima on the Bima, mm -hmm. about a, um, a young child whose mother is a, a rabbi, and one about two satyrs, where it's a child of divorced parents. That's the most recent parents, one, right. And matzo ball, where this little boy goes to the baseball game and has to take his bag lunch full of, full of matzo. That's now, right. All, the, all these books, the... the um, uh, there's someone who's an outsider who's a little bit different. Do do you think that there's some sensitivity that you have? Well, it's interesting because the two woman? the two others yeah. well, the one the second one was, um, mommy never went to Hebrew school, which is about someone who converts to to Judaism, and then where do people go when they die, which is about death and children for children to read about death. Um, I don't know. I don't think I ever saw it quite that way. <laughs> so um, um, the outsider um, maybe. Well, I think. See, I don't know that so much about being, it may be partly being a woman, I think it's partly being a rabbi, because I think rabbis are a little bit of outsiders, like journalists. I always compare rabbis to journalists, because we're not, we're, we're in a community, but not really part of the community, where there's a, a distance, you know, we're, we're always, you know, I'm leading a service. Am I in the service, or am I leading the service? You know, I've been telling, I tell people, 
I joke with people sometimes on a Friday night, and I'll say, oh, you know, I haven't seen her in a while. And they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi, you know, I'm sorry, I haven't been to services we've been. I say, don't worry, you know, they pay me to be here. So I, you can't, <laughs> I can't judge you. I, I know I have to be here. But I think there's a whole sense of, you know, you're, you're not quite in the community. You're, you're out there, and you're leading it, and you're also having to be, you know, strong when people, when someone experiences a funeral, and you might be someone you know really well, but you're still the rabbi. And I, I always thought of it, I used to want to be a journalist when I was younger, so I always thought it was similar, because journalists are not in the story, but observing the story, and, and kind of part of it, but not really a part of it. And I, I think there's a certain similarity. So maybe in that sense, you have to be willing to be a little bit of a an outsider. Um, I, loner is not the word I want to use, but outsider to be successful as a rabbi. Because you want to be, I mean, I think I'm very personable. I'm friendly. I have a lot of people I'm close to in the congregation. But you always have to remember, you're not, you know, there's always a boundary. There's a, there's mm -hmm. a line there mm -hmm. somewhere. Because someday the person who you're really close to is going to call you and say my father died or something happened or I have cancer and I'm you know terminal cancer or whatever and you have to be able to be the rabbi not just a friend and it's it's a little tricky mm -hmm. sometimes it's actually it could be a little lonely well, one area that I see you as being in the story is in uh, Jewish history because mm -hmm. this is such a historic change in in the life of the Jewish people. Do you ever reflect on that and the role that you have played in that? Yeah, and, and it, what's exciting is it worked because, uh, you know, I think a lot of us at first, and I think a lot of people out in the outside world thought this would be like a, you know, kind of a trend, you know, a few years when we would be rabbis and then it would it would end. It wouldn't really, and then of course it, the conservative movement started ordaining women and the, I mean, the reconstruction women before that, but, um, and it was suddenly, and even the Orthodox movement now, the modern Orthodox have women who aren't called rabbis, but are really functioning as rabbis, so, you know, who knew? I mean, uh, you know, who knew that it would kind of really succeed, and and actually the idea of women being rabbis seems pretty obvious now, obviously not in the Orthodox community, but even there, the roles of women, except for the really very Haredi community have, have changed in terms of girls education and a lot of things have changed so I think that's what's exciting that it really it worked you know it wasn't just something that happened for a couple of years and then they said oh come on this really can't work because you know they always worry like oh but what's going to happen when you call the rabbi in the middle of the night and she's got her baby crying and you're on the phone with her and oh my you know those are all kinds of issues you know oh and men aren't going to go to synagogue anymore because women once women are leaders men stop going to services I mean all kinds of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that people raised as, as what they saw as serious issues and you know really didn't happen mm -hmm. that way mm -hmm. so you know that's yeah that's exciting I'm excited you know just to know Sally Presant who's the first woman rabbi I remember introducing her once to um my young colleague who was here before our current, my current assistant rabbi, but Shana Potter, and I said to Shana, Shana, I want you to meet Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it was like, that's how it felt. I mean, I know Sally's a person, she's a great person, but I know I'm standing next to someone who is a, you know, a really important part of Jewish history. It was very courageous and did it when, you know, when they kept telling her not to apply. They kept writing back saying, you know, we don't accept women, and she just kept pushing. So even just having that connection to those people is really, is, is very special. Do, do you think that, um, do you consider yourself a spiritual person? <sighs> people who know me in my classes would laugh because they know that that word is something I'm not really comfortable with. Um, no, I think I'm a religious person. I don't, I don't like, I, I don't, uh, spiritual always seems to me a way of getting around using the word religious and I think I'm very grounded in Judaism and religious tradition and um, uh, I just don't use the word spiritual. It seems a little bit, um, I think a lot of people use it, not the way you use it, but I think a lot of people use it to sort of, because it's a way of connecting to, to God and transcendence without necessarily to institutions or, you know, behavior and I, I tend to like using the word, you know, a liberal religious Jew rather than spiritual. It's just semantics, but it, uh, I tend not to use not to use that word so much. Okay. Um, just a couple more more questions. Yeah, Are there, there any uh, characters from the Bible that you particularly identify with or relate to? 
Oh, um, well, I think, you know, some of the, um, I've been doing a lot of studying actually recently on, on women in the Bible, just for a class I'm, I'm going to teach. And, you know, we're, I'm always doing that. But I think there, you know, there are some very strong women um, in the Bible. I like, for example, not, not necessarily the most famous ones, but like the daughters of Tzlovchad, the women in the book of Numbers who went to Moses and said, you know, we're not getting the inheritance from our father and, uh, you know, we deserve it because we had no sons, we should get an inheritance. And I actually wrote a sermon once about them and what they, who they would be today in the Jewish women's community, the different daughters. I created a midrash. And I think that they're an example of women, and they even have names, which is remarkable in the Bible, that they're all named instead of just the five daughters. You know, unlike, like Lot's wife doesn't have a name, and Job's wife doesn't have a name, but these women had names. Mm -hmm. So they're, I always, I think about them a lot um, in terms of the more, not as well-known, but important, you know, women. Or women like um, Hulda, the prophetess, because they were women who had, like, jobs in the community that people were very normal, that weren't strange, or Deborah, who were really leaders, but not necessarily, no one said, oh, and, you know, she's a woman, isn't this unusual? So those are the women, I, I guess they feel more historical, too. When you get back to the earlier women, it's, you know, they're more types rather than real people mm -hmm. um, to me in my mind. So those are some of the women I, mm -hmm. I think about when I mm -hmm. think of the biblical text. And is, is there a, a prayer or a psalm that is a favorite of yours? Well, I don't know that there's a psalm, but I think in terms of the, the prayer book, um, I do love the, um, the, the prayer after the Baruch Hu where we ask, we praise God for the, 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 you know, the, the, the creation of the world, that the world around us, helping us to appreciate God and that day, that, that day turns into night and night turns into day, the sense of the regularity of nature, that life continues, that there are cycles of life. That always, when I read it or pray it at a service, whether we chant it or we read it, that always means um, a lot to me, that, that prayer. Um, I also think that when we're, um, whenever I'm standing in front of the ark, in front of the Torah, and reading just about anything, you know, Eitz Chaim He, or whatever the, the prayer is, it always still feels really powerful to stand in front of the Torah, looking at the Torahs, and, you know, and facing the Torah, and thinking about what that means in terms of Jewish history, and Jewish tradition, and, and I'm there, hopefully, helping to carry it on. I mean, that, that, that still means a lot to me, especially, I guess, maybe at Bar about Mitzvah services, where, you know, the kids are there, and I'm thinking, okay, and you're here too, and you're gonna, you know, keep it going somehow. So that means a lot to me. Okay. Um, last question is, wh what have you learned about human nature? Oh, never to be surprised at anything. I mean, I'm always, I'm always amazed at what people will, what people's, I guess, people's secrets, people's. Um, you know, that part of it, just that there's so much going on in people's lives you don't know about that's underneath the surface. I'm also amazed at people's resilience. I think that's the other thing because I've seen such terrible things happen to people. You know, the kinds of things, none of us, the kinds of things where we don't want our minds to go there. Someone, let's say, a child dies, um, a some kind of a terrible illness, the things that people have to live with, and the fact that people mostly, mostly survive those things and find some way to keep on going. I have always been just overwhelmed by that and really moved by it and just, you know, I just can never get over it. The fact that most people, you know, and find different ways, but they, they, they continue to live and want to live and that life force is very strong. And so people's resilience is what, um, it, it just, it really makes a big impact on me still. Anything you would like to add? Uh, no, um, you didn't ask me about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're Julie. welcome. Thank you. <laughs>